You have to have a really good story. This is what we do. This is who we do it to. And this is why we do it. We're an industry with a lot of me too, right? There's 2,200 UCAS providers in North America. Why you over anybody else? If you can't tell me that story and tell me who you're really good at serving, then it becomes a spiff and commission war. There is a target audience that benefits the most from what you offer. If you say, hey, you know what? 20 to 75 employees in these two verticals, we kill it. They get this benefit and this benefit from working with us. Boom. They know you're the only name popping in their head when they go for that opportunity. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Incident Report presented by Quest Technology Management. I'm Paul Burke, Director of Technology Communications. Every week, I'm joined by VP of Sales and Partnerships, Adam Burke. The Incident Report brings you conversations with thought leaders, business innovators, and channel mavericks to help you stay productive and agile in a changing technology landscape. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Incident Report. This is episode 53. I'm Paul Burke. I'm half your host. I don't do this alone. Adam Burke sitting across from me. Adam, how are you doing? Good, Paul. I'm super excited to be here. We wrapped up a uh, good first quarter. We're kicking off, if you believe it or not, the month of April. So excited to be here and super excited about our guest today. No time for small talk, Adam. We're excited to have Peter Radizetsky here. He is president of Rad Info Incorporated, a telecom strategy and marketing consulting agency. He's a sales trainer, writer, consultant, and speaker. He is available to speak at your events on channel, marketing, strategy, or sales. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Incident Report, Peter Radizetsky. Appreciate you guys inviting me to be here and congratulations on one year of doing this. Thank you very much. So Peter, everybody loves a good origin story. You think of your Marvel movies, your DC films, everybody, every superhero has an origin story and you've been in the channel since 1999. You've been in, involved for over 20 years. So there's something, something that you enjoy very much about the channel. And I would love to know what is your origin story? What, what brought you to this point? I was working for a couple of buddies from college. They owned a Novell VAR. And uh, working for your friends doesn't always work out for you. And a volleyball buddy of mine had a Bell South agency. No, no, sorry. He had a GTE agency. And GTE was becoming Verizon. He had canceled it. And he's like, why don't you come with me on this little journey? We're going to open a Bell South agency. You can come sell some telecom. And I was like, that sounds awful. That really sounds like a grind every day. But I gave it a shot. And it turned out right product, right time. Talking to people that I could actually relate to. So boom. Then 20... Four years later, I'm still here. Is that one of the things that kept you involved in the channel? Being able to work with people you relate to, sharing products, services, helping people? There's a lot of that because I do a lot of sales training too. So I, there, there's a lot of helping people figure out how to stop transacting LD minutes and broadband and learn how to solution sell other stuff. And we're at a time in the channel right now where we've never had this many vendors looking to the channel. You know, when I started, it was if there was 50, that was a lot. And Peter, you've seen like a definite growth in, in the supplier community. I mean, we, we got involved in the channel in end of 2009, 2010 as a managed service provider. And, and quick quick story about Peter for, for the audience that I, I want to share. I got the opportunity to be on a panel with Peter one time, and he was moderating the panel. And about two months before the panel kicked off, uh, my marketing department basically said, hey, check out this email from Peter. Can you hop on the phone and kind of talk with him real quick? And it was... It was great. And this is why I wanted you to be on the podcast because it was very candid. It was very direct because I have my official title at Quest is vice president of sales. And Peter was hosting a panel about cybersecurity. And you really wanted like someone who could talk actually about what could help the agent as opposed to selling what Quest could do. You know, so it was very direct, like, hey, that's, that's great. Adam's the VP of sales, but can you bring an engineer on or someone that can actually like teach the salespeople about selling something better than talking talking your book. And that was great because I, we got on a call and we had a couple of dialogues, you know, conversations. You're like, okay, Adam's Adam's not going to pitch a slide deck the entire time. He'll he'll talk about lessons learned and things like that. But that was that was a lot of fun. You don't get candid, direct conversations that often in our line of business. And I, I, I that's something I, I appreciated from when we first met. I appreciate that because uh, it's a Ford Chevy thing. Some people like it, some people don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I've got some feedback myself about being a little too being a little candid sometimes, but it's all good. You know, from a supplier standpoint, there does seem to be a huge influx in people 
interested in the, in the channel. We, we've been here 12 years, 13 years now. We've definitely seen that back in the day, not quite sure what an MSP was for a lot of our agents we worked with. And now it's, there's suppliers from everything from ERP solutions to UCAS to all sorts of things. What, any thoughts there, Peter? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing how many have come in and a lot of it, they think it's free sales and then they find out that it's actually not free sales. You're not paying a salesperson, but you have to have a whole very good structure behind you in order for that channel program to actually work. And that, that usually shocks a lot of people. They usually think, yeah, hey, just tell everybody I sell this stuff and all these guys will go sell it and we'll pay them once they close something. But it, it does not work that way. What's the biggest hurdle you see with, with suppliers? What's kind of the, is it that just that assumption that, hey, there's plug into a TSB and, and all of a sudden opportunities rain down on them and revenue spikes by a hundred percent or yep. what's the, that, that, is that kind of, that's the business model that they think they're walking into? Yeah. They, uh, and they don't give it enough time and they don't give it enough funding. It takes three years for a program to even like have a kindling of taking off and, and you have to have a really good story. Like you have to be able to tell somebody, you have to have your elevator pitch down. This is what we do. This is who we do it to, and this is why we do it. And that way they're able to tell the story. A lot of folks, we're, we're in an industry with a lot of me too, right? There's 2,200 UCAS providers in North America. Why you over anybody else? If you can't tell me that story and tell me who you're really good at serving, then it becomes a spiff and commission war. Mm. And the value prop is so important because all of marketing, as Paul knows it, being in that space, falls off of the value prop. Everybody likes the target to be everybody, right? Everybody could, could buy from us and be a potential customer. That's not really true. I mean, you're not selling Kellogg's cornflakes. There is a target audience that benefits the most from what you, you offer. If you tell people that, then it's very concrete in their head. Oh my God, this is a bank, mid-sized bank. This is exactly who these guys service all the time. And then it's top of mind and there you go. You, you have an opportunity. When you say, you know, we serve everybody, banks, manufacturing, hotels, retail, restaurants, everybody, they're like, okay, I, I, I don't have a use case for that. Like, I don't, you're going to be the same 200 names that pop into my head when I'm, when I'm in an opportunity. So tell a good story, let people know why you and what you do really well. If you say we're one to a thousand, they're going to give you a very small deal to test it with you. And you're going to be angry about that small deal. And if you screw it up, you've lost the entire thing over a small deal that cost you a lot of money to put together. Mm. But if you say, hey, you know what? 20 to 75 employees in these two verticals, we kill it. They get this benefit and this benefit from working with us. And we have 75 other companies that are exactly like that. Boom, they know. You're the only name popping in their head when they go for that opportunity. Mm. Uh, that's a great, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, trying to be every, all things to all people, because, because sometimes you can have that limited mindset where you're afraid if you don't tell that agent or that, that partner that, yeah, yeah, we can, we can help with financial services or yeah, we can help with all these different areas that I guess there definitely could be that mindset. I'm sure suppliers have it, that that partner is going to, going to pass over you for that opportunity. But, but you really, I mean, you really only get a couple, maybe one shot with a new supplier or with a new partner. If you're a new supplier coming to bat, like it's not, you don't get a lot of opportunities to uh, kind of showcase where you can win. So I guess, I guess kind of cherry picking or driving them to a, an area where you really can deliver is, is, is pretty critical. Think about it this way. For dentists, there's 330,000 dentists in the U.S. If you got 5% of that market, that's 16,000 businesses. Most vendors would kill for 16,000 businesses, especially mm -hmm. in one vertical. But that's just one vertical. I mean, it's the same like hotels. If you were just chasing hotels, I mean, how many hotels are in North America? Mm -hmm. Hundreds of thousands. And if you had a pitch for that, for a certain size hotel, you'd get a 5% chunk of that. So I realize people can't see this, but as you're sharing all this, Peter, Adam and I are just nodding along because this makes so much sense to us that if you niche down, you're going to help yourself in the long run. So why do you think people resist it? I think Adam made a great point about all things to all people. Is that it in its entirety or is there something else at play as well? They have the, I'm going to be AT&T's replacement mentality of, I want 22 million subscribers, mm. which is, which is great. I mean, but it didn't take them five minutes to get that. They had a long path for that. And everybody thinks that if they pigeonhole into, a, into one spot, they won't get anything else. But I've never seen that be the case. 
ever. The best example I can give is Smoothstone was a UCAS provider, Cisco powered back in mid 2000, probably about 2006 or seven. They, they told everybody 55 employees and up. We will not do 54. We will not do 52, hmm. 55 plus grew like crazy. Cause in their mind, that was it. They only did 55 plus hmm. and they didn't even hmm. want the smaller ones. So even when they did come, they had to make a conscious decision of what well, do we take 50 or do we not? Mastergy is kind of the same way, right? They, they went to market with, we're not AT&T and we're not small. We do global networks that fit really well in the 10 million to hundred million range. So if you have a business in that range, that's us. Grew so well that uh, two PE firms invested in it and they sold it to Comcast. Yeah. I was going to say they had a, they had a couple exits and then, and then now yep. they're part of Comcast business. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's pretty interesting. I was going to say, when you guys got in the channel, it was an interesting time for you guys because MSPs were kind of just becoming a thing then. But they were all VARs before that, and nobody could quite figure out what that MSP model was and what we're supposed to do with that. And, yeah. and now, I mean, look, CompTIA spends most of their time addressing the 62,000 managed service providers in the U.S. It was, it was a marketing buzzword at the time. But it was the convergence. Everyone was talking about the convergence of remember remember the channel partners. I think they they used the word convergence like a million times. I think. But, yes, they um, did. The idea, <laughs> it was the 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 agency model with the IT var kind of, and they always had the circle diagrams and everything kind of coming together. I, th I think we're definitely living in that world now. But it didn't take off like to your earlier point, Peter. I mean, we started it in 2010, and I remember one of our first agent partners who 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 sold a a managed server deal for us. It was about four UCS blades. I think it was one of my first like MRR sales in the channel. And that, I mean, that took me like a year and a half to get that deal. I mean, it, and it was like, and it was like, it was like 4,000 or 5,000 bucks a month. There's still a customer today, which is awesome. But it was my first deal. It was with, it was with top speed data out of Petaluma, California, Glenn and Anthony, if you know them up there, great folks. And, uh, it took a year and a half to get that deal done. And, you know, now we're doing all sorts of things in the channel with all sorts of different partners, but, but man, that took a long time to get that one across the goal line. And, uh, <laughs> luckily for us, we had been in that transition for about, about 10 years trying to figure out the monthly reoccurring revenue model. We went to a Cisco gold lunch back at partner summit. And um, Chuck Robbins, a predecessor, told everybody, hey, you really need to figure out this monthly reoccurring revenue model. You really need to start billing your customers and providing as a service. And Tim Burke, our founder and CEO, took that to heart and started listening and started developing things. And we really built out our service practice. And that was, that was lucky for us. And then a lot of our growth has, has definitely come through, through the channel relationships that we've been building over the last decade. So it's been good. It's been definitely an interesting time, though. Oh, it's been numerous uh, turns and twists. The MSP side had their M&A both in the vendors space and in the provider space. And now we have the, uh, the agent model being M&A like crazy. That PE money doesn't always um, equate to bigger is better. I was reading something you, you put out and I actually wanted to talk to you about it. You mentioned the amount of private equity money that's flown into that, into the channel from an agency roll up and a TSB consolidation. And did I, did I read it right? Did you say something like $800 million or something like that? Has, yep. Was that, okay. And you were, and you had a, you had an interesting statement around those, the private equity guys are gonna want their return on that investment. And in yes, you know, they are. <laughs> three to five year, they usually have a three to five year kind of- Window. Cycle yep. there, yeah. How do you think, and we all kind of know the model. This is a channel discussion. So we all kind of understand the residuals and the, the, all that kind of stuff and how that all flows. Have you, have you figured out how that math's going to work? No, I, don't, I can't figure out what the flywheel is that gets them more lift. It's, you can't scale. They, they aren't building a better mousetrap. It's not like they got a portal that works all by itself. There's just too much interaction involved in, in every order. In every quote mm -hmm. or every customer interaction, there's a support side to it, customer side to it, sales engineering side to it, figure out exactly what they need and want, map it all out, pick the vendor, get some quotes. All that is very labor intensive. Mm -hmm. And we, we have this partner call. It's open to anybody. It's, it's every Thursday at 3.15 Eastern time. And we've been trying to figure this out for like two years. Like where, where is all this money coming from? Because you, you can't sell your way out of it because you you pay out 80%, right? So your top line 
at 100 million, 80 million goes away, you keep 20 million. If you make 200 million, you, you've only got a lift of another 20 million. Like, you, right. Because you're still sitting there. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. There's, there's not enough lift to give you back. And how do I give you back $800 million? What, what are your thoughts on some of the, because we've seen a couple of them and I haven't seen it, haven't seen it catch on too much, but like I've seen a couple of technology service brokers and some of the, maybe some of the smaller ones, they've actually acquired organizations that are turning wrenches and, and do billing like they, cause the master agents, the technology service brokers, they don't, they don't bill anybody really, but what are your thoughts on, I've seen a pivot on a few of them that have started to acquire people that you would think are more on the supplier side of the house, like coming underneath their umbrella. The only way I can map it out in my head is they're maybe going to start at some point servicing their agents, customers directly. That's the only disintermediation play that I can figure out in my head that could maybe jack up that instead of making 20 million on that hundred million dollar revenue, they're, they're making 40 on that hundred. They are trying to get closer to the customer. I mean, part of me is thinking like, do you guys want to like start rebuilding? So instead of it billing through AT&T or Quest, it's going to bill through whoever company, because I don't want to name anybody. Yeah. And you're going to bill. And then you, obviously you could change the margins as you will, because it's white label. So you could change that margin that you're making up to 40% maybe. And that's going to give you some lift. But what you're really seeing is a lot of professional services being bought. They're all mm -hmm. like, we talked to Seth at Blue Wave. He thinks that they're going to either replace Deloitte or be bought by Deloitte because they're going for that model. Mm. So I'm like, oh, so you're going to throw a lot of PS after this. Well, that's fine. But PS doesn't scale either. I mean, ask Accenture. They had to throw 366,000 human beings at, at their product. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's going to have to be a lot of little things, little levers. Like they're going to have to do more PS. They're going to have to do some white label. They're going to have to cut some commissions, which is funny because Ring Central just cut commissions across the board 1% to everyone. Mm. So if the vendors start tightening it up, I really don't know how the, the TSBs pay anybody back because that 1% is top line. So yeah, it, it all looks like the napkin math, the, the bourbon spilled on the napkin math and it bled ink everywhere. <laughs> they lost the well, everyone, thoughts on that napkin. Well, everyone looks like a genius when interest rates are zero. I mean, it's, oh, yeah. it's, I think that definitely helps. Paul and I talk about that a lot, about how the capital markets can kind of affect, I mean, they affect decisions. I mean, as much as we all want to pretend that technology drives everything, it, it does drive a lot, but how people get paid and how people invest, I think it is probably an equal measure there as far as driving what's actually getting purchased at the end of the day. Well, you know? I mean, bankers control an awful lot of levers that get moved around. When you look at a company as big as AT&T, who to make payroll, they, they temporarily sell receivables mm. because of liquidity problems. So sometimes that costs them 5%, sometimes that costs them 7%, right? And, and if you look at the debt, like Verizon and AT&T have north of $110 billion of debt each, but that ranges from 3% to 9%. I mean, when you think about just the interest payments on that is a huge chunk of their free cash flow. So mm -hmm. bankers do affect all. And you're, and you're watching with Avaya and you're watching with Lumen selling older securities to try to get interest rates down, and play all those games. I don't understand any of that stuff. That's all way above my pay scale. But all of that does affect like their payroll and how many people are going to keep it and riffs that they're going to have and CapEx on network and stuff like that. So yeah, a lot of moving parts that, and that flows down too, because like when it affects AT&T, it affects all the AT&T partners and the AT&T wholesale players. And that affects even more partners. So mm -hmm. it's like you, you see the, the wave just go sideways. It kind of like, you know, when Dado and Kayasea merged the, the panic, I mean, you could feel it. <laughs> There yeah. were some, there were some angry, angry town halls. Paul, remember, remember we covered that, that Kaseya yeah. CEO? At, <laughs> That's right. Not happy. Yeah. That was a rough, a couple of rough town halls in that one. There yeah. were some fired up people. Did that sort out, Peter, in your mind, or is that still, still kind of flowing through? That, I think they've come to accept it. And then today, Kaseya spent a hundred and, I don't know, 50 million to rename the Miami Heats Arena in, in Miami. 150 million to rename a basketball stadium? 
It's going to wow. be Kay oh. Kayasea Arena, and they will be holding events there. Oh, well. I'm sure that fired up a few, yeah. few more partners today. <laughs> Interesting use of resources. <laughs> wow. Huh. I'm sure a consultant or two got a good consulting fee on that broker deal. That's good. Yeah, absolutely. Good for, good for them. Wonders never cease in this industry, I'll tell you. Yeah. Well, Peter, what would be your recommendations as you're, you've been in the channel, you, you, you obviously, and I, I've sat in on some of your round tables when those are Thursday afternoons, you kind of make available for anyone in the channel. What are those? Yeah. What are those yep. sessions? Okay. Those are always, those are always fun dialogue. What are your recommendations for suppliers and partners? Cause there, there seem to be, there's definitely some people who've taken the exit and they've kind of, they're, they're retiring and, and, and getting out of the business. There's, there's new up and comers who are coming in. What would be your recommendations for folks that are relatively new to the channel, but, you know, trying to build a brand either on the, on the consultant and partner side of the house, as well as, you know, some landmines to avoid for suppliers. We have a couple of suppliers that we work with a lot who I know listen to the show. So any, any kind of feedback you'd say as far as people who are, they're not brand new to the channel, but maybe they're a couple of years in and trying to stay the course. Never stop learning. You don't have to be a subject matter expert on everything, but you should be able to know what someone's talking about when they throw a couple acronyms at you. Like, I don't have to be a cybersecurity expert, but I have to know when you're talking about, you know, a DDoS attack or something that that's what it is. <clears throat> and I have a vendor for you for that. Mm -hmm. Listen to their customers because their customers are going to tell them where to go. My career mapped out mainly from listening to my customers. They needed this. I went and learned that. And that kept me alive for another couple of years. Then they needed something else that kept me alive for another couple of years. And during all that time, because if you keep serving your customers, you are always going to have a job and a paycheck. Then just keep listening to your customers. And I know that's hard because if you're transactional, you're not really touching the customer. You're like moving along, moving along. But if you think about like Pareto's rule is, 80% of your revenue comes from 20% of your customers, then just talk to those 20% and just stay relevant and stay in their face and you'll, you'll move forward. Hmm. And for vendors, it, it's that in reverse. Your partners also, fall, well, actually, it's not Pareto. It's more like 95.5. 5 percent of your partners bring in 95% of your revenue. Hmm. So stay in constant contact with that 5%. Learn how to grade, grade your partners. Try to move some Bs to A. C's and D's, not so much. They hardly ever move up, but B's can be groomed to be A's. And then you'll, you'll grow the business. And the last piece of advice for vendors is, I know everybody thinks it's thousands and thousands of partners, and we've seen the ridiculous numbers that everybody puts in press releases. 20, I mean, Ring Center puts 27,000 in, in their investor deck, and another TSB says he's got 9,000. The actual ones they give checks to are, are a tiny fraction of that. Mm -hmm. and the, the ones that drive business, I can tell you that even the largest programs around, it's 25 agencies that bring all their business. Mm. So you don't need thousands. You need 25 that are aligned with you. that want to put you in the, put your products in their portfolio and go to market and sell it. That's alignment. You can have thousands that are unaligned that'll drive you nuts with quotes and activity and they'll eat all your stakes and they'll go to all your ball games and they'll golf with you but you'll never get a deal. Hmm. So it's more about alignment than it is about actual numbers and getting people to see that when your KPI and channel manager is just to recruit anybody that can fog a mirror, that doesn't help either. See, I told you, Paul, he loves the reality conversations. That's why I like Peter. <laughs> that is great advice. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody's going to be like, oh, he's full of <laughs> 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 no, it's fantastic. And Peter, if people want to get a hold of you, like what, where's the best place they can find you? Twitter, actually. Rad info on Twitter. Love it. Great. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, this is great, Peter. Thanks for hopping on and really, really appreciate you making the time to join us today. Thank you very much. And will I see you in Scottsdale? You will. Yeah, I'll be in Scottsdale. Excellent. Excellent. Great. And quick reminder, we will be at the Channel Partner Conference and Expo May 1st through the 4th in Las Vegas. Say hello to myself. Say hello to Adam, the rest of the Quest team. You can find us at booth 1902 at the Channel Partner Expo and Conference, May 1st through the 4th.
Thanks so much for listening. The Incident Report is brought to you by Quest Technology Management. With over 40 years of experience, Quest is a leading technology integrator working seamlessly with your staff and systems to achieve your IT goals. Learn more about everything they do at questsys.com. And if you have questions or suggestions for the podcast, you can always email Adam and myself at the incident report at questsys.com. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time.